Good evening. I'm Russell Banks. A courageous writer is one who takes him or herself to a place that's unsafe at any speed, a place where he or she doesn't want to go, and carries a reader, a perfect stranger. And a reader for a novelist is the perfect stranger, along for the ride. So that when we read Marlon James, we have to hold on for dear life, or we'll fall off his broad back and find ourselves more or less where we were when we first opened his book, scared and alone and mystified by our life and the lives of others, or merely ignorant of our life and the lives of others. For he is a brave writer, and to read him right, we must be brave too. His language, for starters, is a riptide that threatens to carry us further out to sea than we've ever been before. As in the opening sentences of James's second novel, The Book of Night Women. People think blood red, but blood don't got no color. Not when blood washed the floor she lying on as she screamed for that son of a bitch to come, the lone baby of 1785. Not when the baby washing crimson and squealing like it just depart heaven to come to hell, another place of red. Not when the midwife know that the mother shed too much blood and she who don't reach 14th birthday yet speak curse upon the child and the papa and then she drop down dead like old horse. Not when blood spurt from the skin or spring from the axe, the cat of nine tail, the whip, the cane and the blackjack and every day in slave life is a day the color red. It soon come to pass when red no different from white or blue or black or nothing. One almost has to go back to the moment when first opening the pages of Faulkner or Toni Morrison or Cormac McCarthy for that kind of linguistic slap upside the head. It's not just the rich, loamy texture of the prose or the forward lunging speed of the syntax or the confident, authoritative naming of the things that fill the fictional world we're about to enter. There's something that's fresh and new in American literature here that is both instantly familiar, i.e. of the family, been sitting around the fire with us forever and just brought in from the cold outside. There's heard here something we needed and didn't quite know we needed. I'm speaking, of course, of the infusion of Afro-Caribbean spoken English. I might better say transfusion than infusion fresh blood, without which constant ongoing transfusions, American English literature would have died in the early 19th century, pale and thin and laid out on a fainting couch. <laughs> and then there is the range of his characters. He's no niche writer with the residents of a county or a village or even a country that he's claimed as his own. He's as inclusive and multiracial and multicultural as we'd like our nation to be. Although he has said in interviews that Jamaica is always at his back, it's at his back, which is as it should be for an American artist. Our origins may aim us, but at a target that's always elsewhere and moving. I'm making a claim here that Marlon James is an American novelist. I hope he doesn't feel appropriated. He may be the first Jamaican-born writer to win the coveted Booker Prize, as he did in 2015 with his third novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings. But I like to note that it was only after the Booker Committee decided to let the Americans compete. And that prize, of course, made him a world novelist, where the universality of his characters and the myths that shape their lives and his imagination can be recognized and internalized by any reader in any language. A few words about the structure of his novels, especially A Brief History of Seven Killings. Back in the 1980s, practically without anyone noticing, the structural conventions of what we call novels began to shift. The old Jamesian principle that's Henry James, not Marlon James. 
the old Jamesian principle that a novel needed to have a single consciousness at its center, pretty much a Western European principle going back to the ancient Greeks, so that, central, so that that central consciousness usually ended up belonging to a man, a white man. A significant number of writers produced novels that spread the central consciousness around more democratically, one might say. I'm thinking of writers like Gloria Naylor, Louise Erdrich, Toni Morrison, John Edgar Wideman. They de-radicalized the notion of collage narration in the process reconfiguring our expectations of plot, normalizing multiple points of view as a way of telling a tale to the point where it has become a not uncommon mode of storytelling even for films and television. Marlon James has extended that de-radicalization and reconfiguration even further. I hope and expect that younger writers will take courage from his achievement and push it still further until a big, bad, bold story can be told from multiple characters' points of view in many places and points in time, making for us a new physics of narrative that has finally caught up to the space-time continuum of our physical reality. There is much, much more to say about the work of Marlon James, and I'm sure that we will get to some of it in our conversation later. So let me simply close by saying what a deep pleasure it is to be able to introduce him to you tonight, and an honor to be able to share this stage with him. Thank you. Thanks to Lennon for bringing me out, and thanks to Russell for that fantastic introduction, which will now become my next blurb. <laughs> Forget the title of the next book, it will just be the blurb going on the whole, the whole page, the whole cover and back cover. Um, so I'm gonna read some, um, some sections from, from my last novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings. Um, the funny thing about this novel, I'll tell you a secret that my publisher doesn't want you to know, is that it's actually a longer book. It's, um, it, it says 688 pages, but I'm sure when you were reading it, you were like, I know exactly where a 600-page novel ends, and I'm still reading this. We may, we, we may, have, decre we, we may have decreased the margin size, but that's all I'm going to say. We may have reduced the font, maybe. The, 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 the funny thing about, the reason why I bring this up and, and I'm talking about Lent so much is that um, this actually started out as my shortest novel. Um, and those of you, who, if you are um, familiar with the book, the very first, the very first um, paragraph, the very first scene I ever wrote is now on page 458. <laughs> because... <laughs> It started out as a sort of, you know, I, when, I started, when, I was writing, when I began writing this book, I was reading a lot of crime fiction at the time. Um, and I'm always reading crime fiction. It's probably my favorite genre other than sci-fi. And um, I was reading all these short novels, um, you know, all the great Jim Thompson novels, a lot of French guys, Jean-Claude Izzo, Jean-Patrick Monchette. I'm like, I'm going to write a 120-page book or a 130-page novel and just get it out of the way. And 688 pages later. And um, another thing I make sure not to point out too much to people is that even though it's a brief history of seven killings, there were eight killers. But killing number eight would be another 400 pages, and I don't think we want that. <laughs> so I'm going to read, um, I'm going to pretty much, you know, there are many characters in this book, so I'm going to be jumping all over, but I think what I'll do is do a set of readings that's set in Jamaica and a set of readings that's set, um, passages that's set in, in the United States in the 80s and 90s. Um, one thing that most of the characters in the first section of the book is doing, are doing, the one thing they all have in common is in one way or another, they're watching Bob Marley. Um, so the main character, so one of the characters is Nina Burgess. And Nina is a person who is convinced that Bob Marley's song, Midnight Ravers, is about her. 
Um, and she's going to use that as a means to get him to notice her and give her some money because um, she's trying to leave Jamaica. She didn't qualify for a visa because she can't prove she has any ties to the country because she doesn't. And, um, but somebody told her they can get her a fake visa. So she has to get the money. So this is her sort of standing, st sort of stalking Bob Marley, actually. 17 buses, 10 minibuses, 21 taxis, 376 cars, I think. And not once did the man step out of his house, not even to get some air, not to make sure that the guards are doing their job, not even to tell the son, later, my brethren, I'm going to have serious work to do. Danny's watch still works. And it wasn't until lunch one time at the Terra Nova when I ran into a former schoolmate. Her breasts drooped down like a tired goat, but still a stuck-up bitch. <laughs> that I found out Timex is the same watch that her father gave the helper for 15 weeks of 15 years of service to the household. This bitch was calling me cheap. I wanted to tell her how happy she must be as a married woman, now that she no longer has to bother with looking attractive. But I smiled. <laughs> I smiled and said, I hope your little boy can swim because I just saw him running to the pool. <laughs> I wish they would invent phones that you can take with you. Or I would have called Kimmy and asked her if she's gone to see her poor mother and father yet. And what are we going to do about leaving this country before something worse happens? Knowing Kimmy, she probably finally showed up in her Ganja University t-shirt and jeans, the one cut halfway down the backside, calling mommy her sister and saying, this is all the plan of the Babylon shit stem. And it's not the robber they should be mad at, but the shit stem that robbed them first. That, that's what they say at the 12 tribes meeting place in that rough and tumble neighborhood called West King's House near the home of the Queen's representative. I really need to get better at sarcasm. I might be a snob, but at least I'm not a hypocrite. Still coasting around because I have nothing to do now that my life's dream to breed for Che Guevara blew up in my face. Nor am I hanging out with rich people in West King's House who don't wash their hair and are calling themselves Rasta to upset their parents when everybody knows in two years they're going right back to their father's shipping company to take it over and marry whichever Syrian bitch just wins Miss Jamaica. Car 367, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, I need to go home. But I'm outside here waiting on him. You ever feel like home is the one place you can't go back to? It's like you promised yourself when you got out of bed and combed your hair that this evening, when I get back, I will be a different woman in a new place. And now you can't go back because the house expects something from you. A bus stops and I fan it off. The bass creeps up from across the road. It sounds like he's been playing the same song all day. It sounds like another song about me, but there are probably two dozen women in Jamaica right now and another 2,000 in the world who think the same thing anytime a song of his come on the radio. But Midnight Ravers is about me. One day, I'm going to tell Kimmy, and she'll know, won't she, that just because she's the prettiest doesn't mean she get all of them. A police car with blue stripes going all around it park itself by the gate. I didn't see it coming. Jamaican police tend to use their sirens all the time just to get people to clear the street so they can reach Kentucky Fried Chicken quicker. <laughs> I never have dealings with the police. I wonder if the guard over the gate is telling the police right at this minute that I've been at the bus stop all day watching the house. But instead, somebody says something, and the fat policeman, there's always one, laughs, and it echoes all the way over to this side. He leaves to get back in his car, but somebody from inside shouts at him, I know it's you. It has to be you. A car coming in on my side of the road, 90 feet? I can beat it before it slams into me. I just know it. The car, 40 feet? Run, run right now. Don't blow your horn at me, you son of a bitch. I'm in the middle of the road, I'm in the median, too many cars driving down on the other side of the road, and me, I'm in the middle, maroon like Ben Gunn, and I just want you to see me. It's you, it must be you. Remember me? Midnight Ravers is about me, even though it was after midnight and you might not know what I look like in the day. 
and I just want a favor. I just need a little help. They robbed my father. No, I don't know, but it's story sounds more urgent when somebody's getting robbed. And I know it's you, and the policeman is waiting. Good, good, good. He's coming outside. It's not you. <laughs> Another guard runs outside to tell him something, and the, fully, the, the fat policeman laughs again and deposits himself in the car. I'm stuck in the median, traffic blurring past me and lifting up my skirt. <sighs> Hello, I'm here to... No visitors. On-site tour start next week. No, you don't understand. I'm not here for the tour. I'm here to see. He's expecting me. Ma'am, nobody coming through except immediate family and the band. You and wife? What? Of course not. What kind of question? You're playing the instrument? I don't see what that have to do with anything. Just tell him Nina Burgess is here to see him, and it's urgent. Lady, you could name Scooby-Doo. Nobody coming in the in here. But, 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 lady, step away from the gate. My pregnant, and it's for him, and him need to mind him picnic. The guard looked at me for the first time today. I thought he was going to recognize me until I realized he really was seeing me for the first time today. He looked me up and down, too, maybe wanting to see what type of woman it takes to breed for a star like him. You know how much women come here since Monday saying the same damn thing you just said? <laughs> Some of them even have belly to show me. Me said no visitors but family and ban. Come back next week. Me sure the baby not running nowhere. Eddie, somebody at the gate, move them. Then after the woman don't want to move, then move her. I step back quick. I don't want none of these men touching me. They always grab on, or grab on to ass or crotch first. Behind me, a car pulls up and a white man comes out. For a split second, I nearly shout, Danny, but this man is only white. His hair brown and long and a little beard on his chin, the way I used to like it, but Danny didn't. A yellow plain t-shirt and tight bell-bottom jeans. Maybe it's a hot weather where you can tell that one, he's American, and two, American men hate underwear with more than American women hate bras. <laughs> Bumba clap, look here, Taffy, Jesus is risen. What, but men I repent yet? The white man didn't get the joke. I stepped out of the way, making too much of a show of it. Hey, buddy, Alex Pierce from Rolling Stone. Wait, then, how tight jeans, Jesus. Two men from Rolling Stone come here already. One named Keith and one named Mick, and none of them look like you. <laughs> I'm from Rolling Stone magazine. We spoke on the phone. You never talk to me on no phone. I mean someone in the office, his, his secretary or something. I don't know. I, I'm from the magazine, from the US. We cover everybody from Led Zeppelin to Elton John. I don't understand. The secretary said December 3rd at 6 p.m. when he's on rehearsal. And here I am, boss man, me doing him secretary. But look, we get strict orders. Nobody in or out except family and ban. Oh, why does everybody have an automatic weapon? You guys police? You don't look like the security guards from last time. None of your damn business. You want to step off now. Eddie, who is that at the gate? Some man, him same as, him, him's about some magazine about lesbians and Elton John. No, Led Zeppelin. <laughs> Tell him to move off. How about me make it easy for you? The man takes out his wallet. I only need 10 minutes, he says. Damn Americans, always thinking we're like them and everybody's up for sale. Just once, I'm glad the guard is such an asshole, but he's looking at the money. He's looking at it long. You can't help it with American money. Getting around the fact that this piece of paper is more valuable than everything else in your purse. That if you whip out, if you whip out one, you change the behavior of a whole room. It just doesn't seem right. A piece of paper with no color but green. Lord knows pretty money isn't the only thing that's worthless. The guard takes one last look at the piling bills and walks away, over to the entrance of the house. I chuckled. When you can't fight temptation, you have to flee, I say. The man looks at me annoyed. I just chuckle more. Doesn't happen every day, a Jamaican who doesn't turn into a yes massa, I go and get it for your massa, when he sees a white man. Danny used to be appalled by it, until he started to like it. Hell of a thing when white skin is the ultimate passport. I was a little surprised at how good it felt, me and the white man both being kept outside like beggars. On the same level in that regard, at least. You'd think I've never been around white people, or at least Syrians who think they're white. 
you fly all the way to, from America just to do a story on the singer? Well, well, yeah, he's the biggest story right now. The number of stars coming out for this concert, you'd think it was Woodstock. Oh, Woodstock was, I know what Woodstock was. Oh, well, Jamaica is all over the news this year. New York Times just did a story that the Jamaican opposition leader was shot at, from the office of the prime minister, no less. Really? That would be news to the prime minister since the opposition have no reason to be at his office. That's not what the newspaper said. Then it must be true then. I guess if you write shit, then you have to believe every shit you read. Oh, come on, don't bust my balls like that. It's not like I'm a goddamn tourist. I know the real Jamaica. Good for you. I've lived there all my life, and I haven't found the real Jamaica yet. <laughs> so I'm going to skip. I'm actually doing a relay thing. I'm jumping to this character, Alex Pierce, who we met in the previous scene. Tight jeans, Jesus. <laughs> so this is him figuring out something is up. Not quite sure what it is. But, you know, in, in Jamaica in 1976, there was always a sense that something was about to boil over. Um, the year started with um, th this mis mysterious poison flower that ended up killing um, a few, few entire families early in the year. By the time we got to the end of the year, the, the ambassador for Peru was murdered. Um, Henry Kissinger was in and out. <laughs> and a bunch of things that was happening. So there was just this sense, even when you were, if you, you know, even if you were just visiting, even if you just got there, there was a sense something was about to break. So Alex Pierce senses it. It's just that he's, he's, he's smart enough to sense that, but not smart enough to figure out what that is. So he keeps getting into trouble. So this is him. Gig like this got its own juice. I'm in Kingston, somewhere between Studio One and Black Ark, thinking there must be a reason why hippies have such a hard-on for this scene. I mean, a poor, boy can, a poor boy can do nothing but sing in a rock and roll band, but a rich boy, on the other hand, can stop cutting his hair, calling himself hippie along with some hairy armpit chicks, confuse having the means to tune in and drop out with a conviction to fucking do it, and call himself a Rastafarian. Then he goes off to St. Bart's, or Maui, or Negril, or of Port Maria, sticking it to the man in between rum punches, always hated hippies. Worse, now you have rich bitch Jamaicans imitating hippies, imitating Rastas, what the fuck? <laughs> but hey, it's Jamaica. At least everybody should be pumping some big youth and Jimmy Cliff. And yet when I get here, first time in a year, the only thing playing on the radio is more, more, more. How do you like it? How do you like it? And I'm thinking, this rep is bogus. I flip on another station, and it's Ma Baker. She knew how to die. Switch to FM radio, and it's Fly Robin Fly up up to the sky. I ask the bus boy at the hotel, so where am I going to hear some Mighty Diamonds and Dillinger? He looks at me like I just asked to suck his dick, and then says, not every Jamaican sell the Collieweed, sir. Even ABBA gets more play than reggae here. I've heard Dancing Queen so much, I can feel myself turning fag. <laughs> I'm in Skyline, the hotel with a commanding view of the hotel in front. In, in Kingston, you go down the street and there's a black guy and a white guy and lots of mixed guys, and they're all at the same hotel, or at the singer's house, or just on the street. Even on TV, TV the weather guy is black. You see black people all the time in the States, but you don't really see them, certainly not reading the news. You hear them on the radio all the time, but once a song is over, they vanish. They're on TV, but only when somebody just acted like a jive turkey, or somebody just made them say dynamite. <laughs> Jamaica is different. A Jamaican is on TV. A white woman just won Miss World, but she's from here. She said that the singer is her boyfriend, and she can't wait to go back to be with him. No shit. Some stone foxes live in this city, and they can all dance. Out the window, even the traffic has music to it. In the resorts, Americans say bumper clat and think they're cooler because they got their head braided by a girl Friday. Not from the movie, this is some Robinson Crusoe black personal slave shit, no kidding. And they looked at me weird when I dropped my drink the first time I heard it. And they learned to talk like a real Jamaican man. People let it all hang out here, they move with a kind of swag, but nobody forgets their place. And if you talk to enough people in the hotel, you get the white tone. 
People being polite to a fault because that's how they were trained to talk to you. And because it's all about race, it fucks up all the time. One time, this black guy asked for the bus boy to take his bags and the boy just walked off. Guy started shouting, this is some slavery loving Uncle Tom bullshit right here for them to realize he was American. And even then the boy asked to see his room key. <laughs> Go out on the street and it's the same thing until, pe and, until you walk far enough and the people get realer. Still, it's Jamaica and this place is kind of ace. Sergey Gainsbourg, the ugly French dude who keeps making cheesy records and scoring hot chicks, has a story. So he comes to Jamaica because he's heir to Duzi Reggae, and motherfuckers at the studio just laugh him off, right? Like, who the bomba clat this little French boy I think him is? Sergey says, but I'm the biggest pop singer. <laughs> they say, we don't fucking know you. <laughs> the only bomba clat French song we know is Je T'aime. Serge says, je t'aime, that is me. Gainsbourg was a god after that. <laughs> so I'm at Studio One and asked one of the men here if he could get me a cup of coffee, black no cream. He says, what, your hand's sick? Get it your blood clot self. Classic, man. I'm supposed to be on Mick Jagger's tale, but nobody's going to call black and blue a misunderstood masterpiece. Not in 10 years and not in 20, and I said so. Fuck him and Keith anyway. And fuck Rolling Stone random most gossip bullshit. I'm this close to getting the skinny on something big. Armageddon time, square biz. The busiest, most vital music scene in the world is about to blow up, and I don't mean the charts. The singer, he's up to something. It took putting, up, putting in a few years uptown and downtown and convincing and some convincing to prove people that I wasn't some stupid white boy waiting for the limbo party for people to start talking to me. The Kingston sissy at the front desk doesn't even know who Don Drummond is. There's this too. Jamaicans are not just the ones working at the hotel, but brown and white men who are always drinking rum at the restaurant and when they see my camera, ask if I'm from Life magazine. Then tell me where not to go. If you go where they go, you end up at Ligony Club where it's fucking disco duck and boring rich bitches who just finished tennis and want to ball. I tell them I'm bailing for turntable club and they look at me and wonder and wonder and ask why, why don't I bother and wonder why I don't ask for directions because they know they wouldn't know. I asked a concierge just a few hours ago, where's the jam session? He says, and I quote, and I kid thee not, sir, why you want to mingle with that element of society? I was this close to saying, dude, suck a dick already, it's cool. But this story, it's something. So I'm in a taxi heading to the hotel, and the taxi driver asked me if I bet on horses. I'm not a betting man, but he is. And who did he see at the tracks a couple weeks ago? The singer. He was with two guys. One of them calls himself Papa Lo. I did some checking on this Papa Lo. Racketeering, extortion, five counts of murder, only one reaching trial and acquitted. Runs a shanty town called Copenhagen City. So here's a singer along with two hoods from a political party he's not supposed to support, and they're hanging chummy like old school pals. The next few days, he's hanging out with Shata Sheriff, the godfather of the eight lanes, controlled by the other party, the other side. Two top goons in one week. Two men who pretty much control the fighting halves of downtown Kingston. Maybe he's just a peacemaker. I mean, he's just a singer. Thing is, I'm catching the drift that nobody else is ever just anything in Jamaica. Something's cooking and I'm already smelling it. Did I mention that there's an election in two weeks? So I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna, um, one last scene in Jamaica and then we're gonna hop the plane to New York. So, Let me see if I can find it. I think I lost it again. Why do I keep losing it? Ah, so um, this is after, you know, this is after the attempt on, on Bob Marley. This is um, some days after. The men have tried to kill him, they failed. And the person who was in charge of the hit is not having a good day. <laughs> so this is him. Um, some things to know, Jamintel. Jamintel Communications, back in the 70s, if you wanted to make an international call, most of the times you still had to go to the telecommunications office and have them place the call for you. 
So when you have the most dangerous man in Kingston still have to stand up in a line at this big phone office to take a call, you can imagine how pissed off he is. <laughs> December 1976, the singer just did the concert, and I'm wasting time at fucking Jamintel Communications because I need to make an international phone call, only to hear Dr. Love and some idiot cursing out in Spanish, but not Cuban Spanish, so I didn't understand most of it but I know he was mad. And I'm thinking, who the fuck does this thinking, thinking can talk to? As if I don't know what hijo de puta mean. <laughs> Why do you think I was going to start cry and say, I'm so sorry, boss man. Next time I'll do it better, I promise. I was about to tell this maricon about his bumbleclad when Dr. Love said to me, just finish the job, muchacho, just finish it. So the Jamaican Syrian, the Cuban, and the Colombian all want a body, yet none of them realize that I gave them something way better than a body. The same week, Peter Nasser from the government calls me with, what the bomba clock wrong with the whole of you fucking ghetto people? This is not the first time I hear, with, hear you with your you people. I didn't say you people, I said you fucking ghetto people. <laughs> what the bomba clock wrong with you? Nine man, eight. So eight men storm into OK Corral with what, 14 guns? And not a single man could shoot straight? Man can shoot straight enough. How you manage to be the first man in history to shoot somebody in the head and not kill him? Answer that. I don't know who you mean by you, or you so fool you think this phone can't tap. What does this look like, a spy movie? Who the rest would tap you? Even so, I don't know who you mean by you, but I'm sure him, whoever it is, didn't aim for anybody's head. He, whoever he is, didn't aim for nothing but wall and sky, it looked like. No, Busher, this kind of slackness and puppet show only happened in comedy. Imagine, hundreds of bullets, and they couldn't take out one fucking man. It's a, it's a fucking machine gun. How hard could it be to shoot? I thought Louis taught you people how to deal with these things. I don't know no Louis, and I sure you don't know no you people. Don't draw my tongue, Josie Wales. I told him, you know, don't make sense you try to teach these ghetto niggers anything that will take any kind of intelligence because they're bound to fuck it up. My blind grandmother could have hit a target better than you. All eight of you. I don't know why I even bothered to call you. I don't really know either since none of these people you're talking about live here. Why am I even running up my phone, Billy? Tell me. I don't know why. What? You know who you're talking to? You know who the bumper clock you're talking to? You little, little. You must drop your pants and look again. I hang up the phone. It's a bitch of a thing when you realize that though you're the only one who didn't go to a top class school and foreign college, you're the only man in the room with sense. I really wanted to, to educate this ignorant, bad chatting Syrian shit house that it's bad enough that plenty men and women have the singer off as a prophet, but kill him and the man graduate to martyr. The, that way, the whole world know that guess what? The prophet is just a man, and like any other man, he can get shot like any other man. And like any other man in this country, not even he's safe. I shoot that man off in pedestal and he fall back down to man size. I didn't tell Peter Nasser any of that. You have to look past the man, below the skin, the real skin, to know that for all the whiteness, in the face of a man who would even go to the beach so even his tan looks black, Peter Nasser is just another ignorant as shit nigger. But at least he called me Busher these days. I must ask my woman when exactly I changed into a white man who drink at Mayfair Hotel. I said to Dr. Love, who also called me that night, I done deal with proving things to people. If they really think this is prep school where they feel they must test and test, then Medellin can go right back to using those faggots in Bahamas. But then, to use Arrasta own words, I get hit with another reasoning. If the singer did turn into a martyr, it would be a big problem for me, sure, but it would be their problem, not mine. Peter Nasser would be so busy shitting himself trying to kill a legend, he wouldn't have time to bother me with this fucker, because truth be told, what he and I know is long past the days when politicians say jump and I say how high. Now when politicians jump, I say, my woman say he can't come to the phone right now, but she will, he'll take a message. Talk about fool, what do you think? So I decided to let my mind work on this new reasoning. December 8, 1976, news just come out that he and everybody survive. Too much police at the hospital, and besides, by the time I grab another Tony Pavarotti, because Weepa was not the man for this kind of kill, the emergency room said treat him and send him home. Only the manager was in the hospital, and I was not much use finishing him off. 
So me and Pavarotti drive to 56 Hope Road expecting police, which means nothing when all you need is one shot. Besides, I make one phone call and the police would disappear in 60 seconds. Except 56 was a ghost town, not a single police. I laugh. Meanwhile, Peter and NASA getting so sloppy that it looked like a TV show on how much mistake one man can make. That stupid piece of dog shit leave a message, a, gold, a goddamn message with my woman that if the sage go on stage, it go and make the page and he'll be the rage. One of the few times in my life I ever hear Tony laugh out loud when I read the note. My woman didn't know what the rascal was going on, so she leave the two of us in the living room. I make a phone call. Where am I flying to? Virgin, where you call me for? I don't like repeating questions. Him gone. They leave the manager at the hospital and take him up to the white man hill. Police? One in the car with them, few more back at the place, 12 tribes on the watch all over the hill, and a white boy, a white boy, a white boy with a camera. Nobody knows where he come from, but he said he's with the film crew. Anyway, me done talk. No, you know, don't talk yet, Inspector. Me done sing this sankey. Don Canary, you just start. Not even Jesus getting up that hill tonight. What about the concert? Full police escort to and from. What about the next day? I don't know, talk. The next day I'm supposed to fly out. They have him on a private jet. When? 5.36. Hmm. Morning or evening? What do you think? To where? Nobody know. So the jet going take off and nobody know where it going? Boss, you take get a man for idiot? Mister, me say nobody know. He don't even know, not even the commissioner know. Is that top secret? It's a bigger secret than the color of the queen's panties. We want to know because old man in the car with them pretend he gone to sleep and listen to them talk. Him white manager tell him up the hill that as soon as he done with the concert, they're leaving. Norman Manley or Tinson Penn? Norman Manley, overseas. You can raid the police up the hill. Yeah, man, but why would that raid the police up the hill right now? So six in the morning and the airport looking like the first reel of a cowboy movie. The only thing missing was whistling wind and tumbleweed. Me and Tony Pavarotti waiting in a stairway leading up to the waving gallery. Somebody thought it was a good idea making this wall like a checker pattern with an open space to stick a rifle through. Checker pattern shadow leave we in the dark. Pavarotti was shifting and moving. He wasn't liking this angle at all. But the plane was already on the runway. Pavarotti is quiet, his right hand gripping the trigger, his left eye in the rifle ends. Way at the end of the runway, two jeeps hang back lazy, Jamaica Defense Force, with four or five soldiers behind them, two without binoculars. Two with binoculars. See them from the second I was in the waving gallery. Soldiers on the hill looking out, making me think the singer coming down the hill. The look on his face when he wake up and see no police, I wish I, would, I saw. He probably sent two or three raster bridging ahead to make sure the road is safe. With, you can, and with two, with, sorry. Safe, with he and his right-hand man coming down the hill alone. With no soldier watching through the binoculars, you can assume one or two things about the police. One, make a deposit to a bank account or a back pocket and anything can happen. And two, they always come cheap. But with soldier, you never know. They hang back, standing, watch maybe. But maybe just waiting. Make sure you take him out before the soldiers drive over. Paranati, Pavarati nods. 602, everybody but the sun waiting on the singer. For a second, it feels like I'm waiting for a parade, like that grainy newsreel that come on TV every November about Kennedy in Dallas. Everybody waiting on the singer, not just me, not just the soldiers, not just Pavarotti or the plane, but Peter Nasser, Dr. Love, and a phone number for the Medellin drug cartel I never use. But then I wonder, is everybody waiting to see his next move or mine? Who is the real dancing monkey in this episode? Who are people watching to see? And if people said jump and you managed to jump high, do they stop telling you to jump or disrespect you forever because you didn't act like a man and say, fuck you, go jump yourself? The problem with proving something is that instead of leaving you alone, people never stop giving you new things to prove, harder things, bullshit things, until it become a comedy or just a joke. Tony Pavarotti tapped my shoulder. He's here. He and another raster walking to the plane. Nothing moving but the dust they kick up. The airport is still empty and not waking up till seven. 
They look around while walking, moving slow, stopping one second, moving again. The singer looked to the plane, scanning left and right, with the other rasta walking backwards, making sure nobody following them. Both of them see the army jeep. The singer look at the jeep and look at the plane. Nobody move. Tony Pavarotti turning the gun to aim, following them. His fingers slip around the trigger. The singer looking at the soldiers and says something to the rasta. They start moving again, but slower, stopping right in front of the plane. Maybe they're waiting for somebody to come out. I remember that Tony Pavarotti don't need orders from me. I hear a click. Stop. Pavarotti, look at me. Look at the two of them running to the plane now. Don't bother with it. They run to the plane and have to close the door themselves. When I get two phone calls the next day, I cut both short with the same line. You want him dead so much, you kill him. So, I'm gonna read one, one brief scene in, um, that's set in um, America, actually. So, total change of pace. This is a character, her name is Docker Spam, and she's a caregiver in New York in 1986. And um, this is her getting her new assignment. I'm just gonna read a little part of it. She, what, all you need to know about Darkest Palmer is that her name is not Darkest Palmer. <laughs> um, and this is her about to re report for a new job. <laughs> you know how them girls stay? Come all the way to America and still going on like them is some dirty whore from Gully. Me tired of them girls is so tell. Me tell this nasty slut who was working for Miss Calters. Nasty slut, me say. As long as you look at you working in this year's job and living under that there roof, you better lock up that pum pum, you understand me? Lock it up. Of course, the bitch never listened and now she's pregnant. Of course, Miss Carter has let her go, and my recommendation, of course. Can you imagine some little stinking bottom pitney running rapid around the place on Fifth Avenue? No, Baba. The white people would have one of them white people things, a conniption turreted. So does she go by Miss Calters or Ms. Calters? So does she go by Ms. Calters or Ms. Calters? What a way you stosh us. Them going like you quick. Boy, sometimes me don't even know which. Soon as she start reading some magazine named Ms., she says she named Ms. Calters, my love. Me just say, ma'am. Ma'am, like some slavery thing. For once she didn't know what to answer. Three years now, I'm with God Bless Employment Agency. And every time I come in here, she has a brand new story about some ghetto slut who got pregnant on her watch. What I don't understand is why she always feels I'm the person to tell these things to. I'm not trying to be un understanding or empathetic. I just want a fucking job so that my slumlord doesn't kick me out of my top class fifth floor walk up with a toilet that makes murder sounds when you flush it and rats that feel I should sit up on the couch and watch TV with me. Trying to use them word around the cultures. New York people ants about them kind of remark. Oh. At least you have one of them Bible names they love on a Jamaican. Can you imagine? Last week, me get a man a job. Probably because him name Hezekiah. Who knows? Maybe they think that nobody with a name from the good book going thief. You're not no thiefing girl. She asked me this every week I come to pick up my pay, even though I've been here three years. But it looks like the cultures aren't the usual clients, clearly. Where's my 10th grade teacher now for me to tell her what doors I've opened up in life just by knowing how to speak correctly? Miss Betsy's looking at me. Some jealousy, sure. Some envy, too, because I have what beauty contestants call deportment. Pride, of course, because she can finally use somebody to impress the cultures. And but pity, too. That one, most definitely. She wondering how a girl like me come to this. No, Miss Betsy. Good, good, wonderful, good. Don't ask me why I was walking past Broad on Broadway past 55th, because not a damn thing was going on, on that street or in my life. But sometimes, I don't know. Walking on a New York street, it doesn't make your problems easier or manageable. It just, means like it, it just feels like you can just walk. Maybe I was just bored. People here with three jobs looking for a fort, and I wasn't even working. So that meant walking. Anyway. Walking down Broadway past 55th Street, looking out for freaks and flashes and everything I saw on TV. This little sign was sticking out between two Chinese restaurants on 51st, God Bless Employment Agency, which was enough to make it clear Jamaicans run it. But if that didn't do it, 
Then the proverb at the bottom of the sign, a soft answer turneth away wrath, which didn't have a fucking thing to do with anything, certainly did. The only thing left was to add international in the title. But I had some nerve thinking I could just start down to a place that existed for losers like me. After all, there are only so many times you could call your American ex in Arkansas and to ask for money to help him, for him to help you, and for him to say, fine, I'll send you some cash, but if you ever call my house again and threaten to talk to my wife, I'll make a little call to the INS, and you'll see if you don't find your conniving nigger ass on the next fucking flight back to Jamaica, catching one of those clear plastic bags they give deportees so everybody in the airport knows which brand maxi pads you use. I didn't want to tell him that the word nigger didn't have quite the kick he was counting on, nor bitch, nor cunt, since Jamaican girls don't respond to those things. But yeah, I was in no position to walk past anywhere called employment agency. You know why I'm giving you the job? Because you is the first girl to come in here with some manners. Really, Miss Betsy? We've also had this conversation before. She runs an employment agency that places mostly black women, mostly immigrants, into posh houses to take care of their very young children or very old parents who have the very same needs. In exchange for us putting up with shit, sometimes literally shit, they don't ask questions about immigration or employment status and everybody wins. Well, two people win, I just collect the money. The first client she sent me to was a white middle-aged couple in Gramercy too busy to notice their weak mother smelling like cat shit and talking about those poor boys on the USS Arizona. She was in a room by herself with a thermostat set at 50 degrees. The first time I met the couple, the wife didn't look at me at all and the husband looked at me too long. Both wore all black and the same black round glasses like John Lennon. She just said to the wall beside me, she's in there, do what must be done. For a split second, I wondered if they expected me to kill the woman. <laughs> and what woman? In the room, there was nothing but pillows and a bed sheet heaped up on the bed. I had to come in closer to see there was a little woman in the middle of it. The piss and shit nearly made me walk out until I remembered the money orders were done coming from Arkansas. Anyway, I lasted three months and it wasn't the shit. There always comes a point when you're living in a house with a man, when he start to think he can walk around with no clothes on. <laughs> the first time he do it, I could tell he was really hoping I'd be taken aback, but I just saw another old person to nurse. The fifth time, he said the wife was gone to her mother of veterans meeting, and I said, so you need me to figure out where you've misplaced your drawers? The seventh time, he jiggled it in front of me, and I started laughing so loud I hiccuped. <laughs> the mother in the room started shouting, what was the joke? And I told her I didn't care. <laughs> she laughed too, <laughs> saying his father was just the same, always putting on a show when nobody bought any seats. <laughs> From that day, the mother was always sharper on me. She even developed a lick of sass. Too much sass for cocky jiggler. I quit before he fired me and told Miss Betsy, well, I will scoop up any load of shit. I will have nothing to do with a withered penis. <laughs> she was impressed that I managed to stay in standard English the whole time, even when I asked if this was a whorehouse with granny care as a fringe benefit. <laughs> it must be immaculate conception high school you come from, she said. Holy childhood high school, I said. Same difference, she said. Thank you. <laughs>